No, I'm not really talking about the walls being down and being more, seeing more of the new construction going on, although that is exciting too, isn't it? And, uh, you know, we can't walk out there yet. That's still a construction zone. So that's very exciting. We're looking forward to the completion of that here in a matter of weeks, hopefully, and, and uh, being able to use our new entrance. But I'm talking about what occurred, um, started this weekend this, with the Olympics. The Winter Olympics are here, 2018 in Pyeongchang, Korea. Hope I said that right. And as, if you watched any of the opening ceremony, I didn't watch the entire thing, but I watched part of it, and there's always that parade of athletes. And for each group of athletes, they have a moment of glory as they enter that arena, representing their country, taking in the whole atmosphere, whether they have one athlete or 142. Each has their moment of glory as they circled that stadium and then went to their seats. And then already some individuals, and over the next couple of weeks, many individuals will have an individual moment of glory as they mount that three-leveled little mountain to stand on top as the victor in their particular sport and to receive that gold medal while their country's national anthem plays. Moments of glory. In our text for today, the Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter, we also see Peter, James, and John experiencing a moment of glory as Jesus takes them up to the mountainside. I want to take a look at this text with you, kind of go through it verse by verse. If you have the bulletin, you've got it right there on page five. If you've got your own Bible, you can use it. In the Pew Bible, it's page 718. No, that's not right. It flipped on me, 714. And um, this is NIV. I'll be using the ESV text, which is what's in the bulletin as well. One of the first things we see there, though, that after six days, well, after, the, after Jesus had foretold to his disciples his death and resurrection, that's what it's after. Six days later now, he takes them up to this mountain, takes with him Peter, James, and John. Uh, and one of the questions that pops out at me right away, there's several questions that pop out at me in this text. One of them is, why did they go up a mountain? I mean, that sounds like a lot of work, right? <laughs> well, a possible answer that, well, it's a solitary place. They're going to have some privacy away from all others. And uh, that's certainly a, a possible answer, and that's part of the answer, but it's only part of it. He did want a place where, Jesus did want a place where they would be alone, where they wouldn't have interference from others. So he takes them up the mountain, but why a mountain? Couldn't he have gone other places for privacy? Well, yes, he could have. As we look at the scriptures, we, though, we see that mountains have great significance for the people of Israel. For mountains throughout the scriptures are places, especially in the Old Testament, where God reveals something about himself, his plan of salvation, uh, his will for us as people. He's revealing things on mountains. Remember back in Exodus, after the children of Israel had been led out of Egypt, they're, based, they're all camped around Mount Sinai, and God calls Moses to come up to the mountain. And there God reveals to him his law and many other things, but that law that was written on two tablets of stone. And Moses even asked God, you know, if he could see his glory. And God said, no, because no man can see the glory of God and live. So he said, there's a rock over here. You go here and you stand on that rock and there's a little space between. I'm going to pass by. When I pass by, you can't look and make sure God covered that he says, but after I've passed by, then you can look. And so Moses goes over there, and, he, and the glory of the Lord passes by, and then God removes his, uh, whatever he did to stop Moses from seeing that, and Moses could only see God's back. Also in the Old Testament, the prophets often speak of, or God uses the prophets to talk about things that he's revealing, especially as he's going to send his servant in, and he reveals things about the coming of his kingdom using such words like on this holy mountain 
And some people think that only refers to Jerusalem, but no, it's, a, it's again, it's a place of revelation that God is saying something to them. And then when Jesus begins his ministry, Matthew records there in chapters 5, 6, and 7 a, a lengthy discourse by Jesus. We call it the Sermon on the Mount because mountains, uh, Matthew says they went up into a mountain. Now Luke also records this event, and he says that this discourse was given on a level place. Now in just a moment you'll see they're, they're not really contradicting each other at all. But Matthew makes a point of saying it was on a mountain because Matthew is writing to Hebrew people who have come to know Christ as their Savior. And so he knows that when he says that, that their God is revealing something to them. And so his readers will understand that. Now for Luke, he's, he's writing to a, a Roman uh, ruler, and mountains don't have that significance for him. So he's a little more exact in his description. Up in this mountain, there is a level place. We might call it a mesa. Uh, and that's where the people were gathered. They were still up in the mountain, but just on a level place there where they were gathered together. So there's really no, no contradiction. So they're going up the mountains, Peter, James, and John. They know Jesus is going to reveal something to them. That's why they're going up the mountain. He's going to make something known, something that's been hidden from them, something that's a, a mystery to them. But then as we look at the text, we reach to a couple of other, why do they need this, a couple of other questions, why do they need this pri privacy? And why only Peter, James, and John? Why only three of the twelve? No, why not all of them? Well, those are all good questions. And very briefly, Jesus wanted a private place because he, um, what he was going to reveal them was meant only for those who knew who he was and what his purpose was. And from among those 12, Jesus took the, uh, um, only those who were closest to him, Peter, James, and John. They're kind of like the, the three musketeers, you might say, with Jesus. Uh, often identified Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane later on. He'll take Peter, James, and John with him closer in than the rest of the disciples. Peter is the oldest of the twelve, and John is the youngest. So he covers the whole age span. And then there's James, the brother of John, who's going to be imprisoned and then martyred by Herod Agrippa in 44 AD. They know Jesus intimately. And so he has going to, he's going to reveal it to them, and they will bear testimony to others. In fact, even Peter says, and we beheld his glory on the holy mountain. He writes that in his letter. So Jesus is going to re make known a mystery. But what is this mystery? And I think sometimes we really miss the point here. Well, let's we take a... Uh, uh, just to look at this, let's take a look at this whole season of Epiphany. After Epiphany, the day of Epiphany, January 6th, the first Sunday after Epiphany has as its gospel reading the baptism of Jesus. And if you remember what happened at the baptism of Jesus, after he was baptized, the, a dove, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove. And there was a voice from heaven, the voice of the Father who said, This is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Then we read here in Matthew 9 on this Transfiguration Day, for, um, after he led them up to a high mountain, and he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. So Jesus is standing before them, and this transfiguration happens, and then we're told that Moses and Elijah are there with him, and they're talking. And we often think that that's the high point, and it certainly is a high point. Jesus is revealing his glory to these three, not in all of its fullness, because they couldn't see it in its fullness, just like Moses couldn't. God has said that no man could see the glory of God 
and live. That's why Peter says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make some tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And, it's then, and then the writers tell us, both Matthew and Mark tell us that they didn't know what they were saying because they were terrified. They were terrified because they thought they might die and be separated from God because they saw his glory. But then something really remarkable happens. Oh, what were they talking about? By the way, Matthew gives us that. They were talking about Jesus' coming death and resurrection. Matthew tells us that very clearly. So then what happens? Well, the next thing is that a cloud comes and covers Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And the disciples are, Peter, James, and John are bowed with their faces to the ground. They cannot stand in the glory of God. They fall down. And, and, and they're in a form of worship, but yet they are terrified. And then there's a voice, the voice of the Father that comes from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. The same words as the baptism very similar words. The key words, this is my son, my chosen one, in whom I delight. Those words come from Psalm 2, verse 7. That psalm was used at the coronation of kings in the Old Testament, the kings of Israel. And there the kings were called sons of the Lord. Sons of God, this is my son, was the declaration that was read from the scriptures, pointing that this person stood as God's representative over the people of Israel. But it was also always pointing to Jesus, who was the true son of the Father, who is the true king of Israel, the one who rules over all things by his power, the one who rules over his church by his grace. And the one who rules in heaven and is leading us to that kingdom of glory. And so they recognize that, yes, Jesus is the king, the chosen one, the Messiah, the Christ, the one that God had appointed to be the savior of his people. You see, Jesus is strengthening his disciples for what is to come. He knows that this is going to be a tough week for them as they see Jesus being mistreated, beaten, crucified, and dying. He knows that they're going to have their doubts. And he wants them to know that they have nothing to fear. They don't have to be afraid of the Jews they don't have to be afraid of dying. They don't have to be afraid of the Roman government. They don't have to be afraid of anything. And how does he do that? It's only as he veils his glory with this cloud. Because then we read at the end of the text there, after they heard the voice, looking around, they no longer saw anyone but Jesus. They were no longer afraid. Because now they knew that Jesus was going to be with them no matter what. And he removed their fear by hiding his glory in all of its fullness from them. Well, now that's kind of interesting, I think. You know, sometimes when you, th I don't know what you think of when you think of God. You may have different pictures. You may have a picture of God as a, as a loving old grandpa sitting in a rocking chair, you know. Well... Not really, you know. Pastor Keith mentioned last week, I think, that, that Jesus isn't always who we expect him to be. You know, yeah. And uh, sometimes we have some false images. Sometimes we picture God as someone who's far off. Sometimes we just picture him as kind of a, a superhuman, you know, just a little bit taller than everybody, more powerful than everybody, a little smarter than everybody. None of those are really great pictures for us. The fact is that the glory of God is so awesome, so great, so wonderful that it is really fearful for us to behold. And so sometimes we may go around through life being afraid of God, not knowing what he's going to do with that almighty power of his. Maybe he might zap us and, and, and that's it. We're separated from him forever. But we know because of Jesus 
that he's harnessed that power with his love. And it's his love that caused him to send his son Jesus to take our places, which is what he did in baptism. He joined arms with you and me, with all of humankind. He identified him, he who was holy and sinless identified himself with sinners. That's why he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And notice how the two are joined together. They kind of form brackets around this whole epiphany season. As we hear the, the same declaration by God the Father at his baptism, as well as just before he's going to the cross for us. That really shows us that his baptism, his life, the transfiguration, his death, his resurrection, his ascension are all one thing. It's what God is doing for us for our salvation. To remove fear from us that we don't have to be afraid of God because of our sin. But instead we know that Jesus, who is God, is also man. But he's the hidden God. We don't always see him in all of his glory. And that's probably a good thing for us. And he comes to us in hidden forms. He comes to us through his word. It's not scary to sit down and read God's word to us. And he comes to us in simple things. Like water to which he's connected his word of promise. To make us members of his family. Like unleavened bread and, and wine to receive the very body and blood of Christ, hidden and veiled, but present in those elements. And then to hear those words given for you, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. You see, that's the high point of our worship is the proclamation of the word and, the, and also the receiving of the sacraments. It's what means so much to us because these precious gifts of God are the ways that we know of God's love for us, that we know that he's present with us always, and that we have nothing to fear, come what may. We don't have anything to fear in this life. Jesus has come to remove fear from us. And so he comes and identifies with us as a true man, who at the same time is true God, who won the victory over sin and death for each of us. And he reveals that to us. And it's the most glorious mystery that's been made known. That in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. And his glory is with us. And he's leading us to glory. And he's changing us to be like him. That as we receive his body and blood, we are becoming more and more like him. And we are receiving his glory. May you live each day in the joy of knowing that you have nothing to fear. Jesus is with you, not far off, not inactive, with you step by step, even when you're sleeping, watching over you at all times, caring for you, leading you to himself in heaven to be with him forever. Let us live in the joy of this glorious mystery, be, mystery that has been revealed to us. Amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.